Hello, it's Scott Manley here. As you may have heard, there was a presidential election in the US on a Tuesday night. And, uh, well, President Trump is coming back. And I'm here to talk about the effects this will have on spaceflight for the next four years. And yes, I know this is going to be a little bit political. And if that offends you, then go and watch my video about how Blue Origin's new shepherd is like a giant willy. But for those of you who are actually interested in a sort of dispassionate political analysis and maybe a few jokes about big willies, um, yeah, what does this actually mean? Well, one of the big deals that happened during the, the last few months of campaigning was Elon Musk coming in big time supporting Trump and making the statement that if you value spaceflight, then, you know, you have to be on board with Trump's plan. And to be fair, during the last four years, Kamala Harris, who had been essentially, because she's the vice president, she was the head of the National Space Council, wasn't exactly the most visible member of that council. Um, but having said that, four years ago when I made this very same video, a lot of Trump fans were saying, oh my God, Biden's coming in, Artemis is going to be completely scrapped, we are not going to the moon. And I said, no, that's not how this happens. And I'm right, because of course Biden came in and immediately increased NASA's budget to support these new things. So look, politics of spaceflight is pretty complicated. So yeah, what have I heard? In the last, in the last uh, your 24 hours or so, I've heard people saying, great, we've got into power, let's destroy NASA. We should just replace it with SpaceX. That's a ridiculous idea for very many reasons. Let's cancel SLS and make everything Starship. That is also complicated for political reasons. So, starting with Artemis, will that stay or will it go? No, I think it's definitely going to stay because Artemis really started out during Trump's term. It was finally about 2018 where he, he decided that he wanted to see humans on the moon because he wanted that Nixon phone call moment. He actually had set a date of 2024 and that was incredibly unrealistic because the plan that had been formulated by NASA at the time was largely a political thing that was built around, you know, minimizing the political difficulties of organizing and budgeting this thing by heavily involving SLS, but it made the technical difficulties of the whole thing a lot more difficult because they then had to have the gateway and they had to have these private contractor HLS thing. And then Congress wasn't really pushed by the executive to fund the HLS thing. So they had almost no money and they ended up giving it to the only option that was going to work, which was, of course, SpaceX's Starship. And so, yeah, the fact that this never made the 2024 date was not surprising to me at all. I wish them the best of luck, but, you know, I never expect that to happen. It's currently on schedule for 2026. I think that's still pushing it a little. 2027 does feel more likely. And 2028, well, that would be the original date that was in that NASA plan. And I'm going to say, to Trump's credit in this case, he did start it and he, and, you know, if you look at the Apollo program, when Nixon is phone calling the, the astronauts on the surface of the moon, he had had nothing, almost nothing to do with the Apollo program prior to that. You know, it was all Kennedy and Lyndon Johnson, right? <laughs> so, you know, this would actually, if it does get to the moon and he does make that phone call, then it'll be actually the first time that the president making the phone call deserves it, right? And so I'm going to give him that one, right? I, you know, I'm still, you know, he uh, was hanging out at the DM2 launch and trying to make out like it was his thing when it was like, no, that was, that was really more Obama and Bush that had made that happen. But look, whatever, like Artemis, I think is going to continue. And while there is definitely an argument that SLS is absolutely a boondoggle that should not be happening and is wasting huge amounts of taxpayer money. I don't think that's going away right away because they're too committed to landing on the moon using that. It's too much part of the plan. And if they take that out, that is going to delay the thing anymore. And again, that then risks pushing it past the end of the, the next presidency. And it also would then risk China getting close. And there's a lot of people that don't want to see that happen. But yeah, is SLS under threat as a result? Um, and sure, yeah, I, I can see that with uh, Elon hanging out with Trump and possibly mentioning just how big a waste SLS is compared to the Starship program, that he, there could definitely be statements made to that uh, effect down to Congress. But Congress 
is the one that actually passes all the laws and holds all the budgets, you know, holds all the purse strings and so and so so on and so forth. And the SLS contingent there is pretty strong. They're very good at defending the money that is coming to their states. So they wouldn't want to see SLS just thrown away, right? They're not going to throw it away unless they get something else coming into their state. So is there going to be potentially some giant bribe coming down in some form that would make up for the loss of SLS? And I, I'm not sure how that would be negotiated. Now, there are parts of SLS that could be repurposed into a future space program. They've got this magnificent machine that welds and builds the giant tanks of the SLS core stage. Those I could make for great like giant space station modules and things like that. But other things like the giant boosters, those are pretty much SLS only. There's not much application beyond that. Would you have to then buy the, you know, bribe those people by saying, okay, well, we've got a new generation of uh, ICBMs that we're building and we'd like to give you the contract and replace, you know, to replace the loss of the, uh, the boosters. And then there's the engines. You know, again, same thing. Now, Orion, um, that's actually the one that's blocking the program right now because of the problems with the heat shield and the spallation off the bottom, which they haven't actually announced the, the reason for this. Uh, Orion's actually in a better place because it's largely functional other than that. And it could theoretically ride on other rockets. It's a bit fatter than you than would be nice for a Falcon 9. It would fit nicely on a, a Vulcan or a Blue Origin new uh, Shepard. So that's not unreasonable that SLS could somehow go away, but I don't think it would go away quickly enough to change the plans to land on the moon because I think that really uh, the new president, or uh, the new old president, because yes, he is going to be older than Joe Biden, remember, the guy who they were worried about being too old. Uh, yeah, he <laughs> he's... he's wanting to make that a uh, historic return to the moon thing that totally fits into his style. Um, so yeah, I, I don't see SLS going away quickly anytime soon. Uh, and NASA, by the way, yes, yeah, people talking about you know, replacing NASA with SpaceX. You've got to understand, guys, every time you say this, NASA is not a competitor. It is the customer, right? It is the one that gives SpaceX things to do. NASA doesn't just build spacecraft and design space missions and stuff. It does a lot of the basic research that feeds into the US's space companies. They have the research facilities, the wind tunnels, the arc jet facilities, the test stands, and they make these available via Space Act agreements. Now, maybe you want to spin that off into a separate company or something like that. I mean, back in the 2016 you know, Trump term, they tried to privatize air traffic control, and that went on around for a while until they realized, oh, wait, we'd just be giving away billions of dollars of stuff with nothing in return for the US government. So um, again, I don't see NASA going away anytime soon. And so then that brings us to the next question. NASA. The, so that brings us to the next question, the NASA administrator. You see, when um, you know, Trump came to power first time, he actually took a really, he took longer than any previous president to select uh, the next NASA administrator. And when he did, it was Jim Bridenstine. And he was a great pick. He was awesome. Like people just liked what he did. He liked his vibe, liked his energy, and he he was pretty good at bringing people together. Now he, some of the contracts he may have presided over, turns out there are some flaws with them. But you know, whatever. It's it's a big thing, and managing NASA is really it's an administrative role. And so, who would do this? Well, could Jim come back? That's possible. Uh, one thing that might work against him is that Jim went and uh, he endorsed, I think. Uh, Ron DeSantis during the primaries and he never seemed to make any noise about supporting Trump during the election and that might actually count against him you know because we know that, that loyalty is something that Trump likes. Now one interesting thing came up about Bridenstine yesterday and he previously he had been chairing the Mars sample return like working group meetings for a while and they had a meeting yesterday and he wasn't there and they said that he had uh, you know left a couple of weeks ago. I don't know if that says anything about his future prospects of being uh, administrator of NASA again. Uh, there are plenty of other highly qualified options who haven't been visible one way or another. Uh, Greg Autry comes up, um, and I've in interacted with him on Twitter. Uh, yeah, you know, he's a great space policy guy. He has a strong opinion that the US should be really focusing itself on beating China in space. 
And I, I largely agree with that. He was actually nominated to uh, like NASA CFO position back in 2020. But it, you know, with all the other stuff going on, it never made it to the Senate until December 2020, by which point it was clear that Trump wasn't going to be president. So it was sent back and he never, you know, he's, he's elsewhere right now. But, you know, he's said, he's said a lot of supportive things about Trump. He said a lot of supportive things about NASA and space flight. So he could well be in a good position to get selected. But there's plenty of other people like Homer Hickam. He just dropped a whole bunch of nomination suggestions on Twitter. And I, I, I can't find flaw, fault with any of them. The only ones I would say is that he mentioned things like Gwyn Shotwell, who, um, again, obviously is doing a fantastic job at managing SpaceX. But I don't think she'd be up for NASA administrator because, you know, who's going to manage SpaceX? You can't do both at the same time. Tori Bruno came up and that's an interesting one because, of course, uh, you know, ULA, is, we know it's for sale, right? And maybe if it gets sold, then it needs a new CEO and he might be in the right place at the right time to step into this role. But he hasn't been particularly, you know, talking much about, you know, vocal, about uh, politics. Anyway, um, yeah, there's there's some options out there and it'll be interesting to see who they pick and I just hope they make as good a choice as they did last time. Uh, what about NASA budget? Uh, well, so NASA budget, we mentioned that, you know, first time when, when Trump came in, first of all, we were coming off the Obama years and the NASA had the the budget had been kept down by the, the sequestration rule, which was like a rule that had been passed to limit the amount of money that could be put into it because of, you know, deficit growth and that got cancelled as soon as Trump came in and Trump used that to raise NASA's budget in his proposal by seven million dollars out of 1.9 billion. It was actually technically a cut but of course uh, when that went to Congress, Congress says well you can't cancel all this stuff we're going to put it back in and we did actually get a modest bump in the NASA budget for the first few years and then you know Artemis became a thing then we started to see some real budget growth. But, you know, it wasn't really enough to actually make HLS happen, for example. Uh, when, when Biden came in, we got to see some co more continued growth. And then just in the last year or so, we've had the Fiscal Responsibility Act, which has once again capped and pushed the numbers down. So NASA's budget has been unable to grow. But like between the Fiscal Responsibility Act and the sequestration rule, you'll notice that these both happen when... Uh, the president is from one party and Congress and stuff is from the other party. I expect that the Fiscal Responsibility Act might suddenly not be so relevant when uh, everybody's all on the same side anymore and uh, the deficits are less important than making you know, people happy in their various districts. That's my suspicion. So we might actually see some positive growth on NASA budget in the next few years as a result of that. Having said that, there's been a lot of promises made during the campaign about various things that will happen. And Trump, of course, loves to promise tax cuts. And he's made all sorts of bold things about tariffs and tax cuts and things like that. And modeling of this says that if that were to all happen, then we would be seeing a deficit of like $7.6 trillion. I don't think that's going to happen. Nobody's that stupid. But we may well see some more tax cuts and some growth in the, in the deficit. And that might put some downward pressure on NASA's budget, or it might put some pressure to cut things. And guess who has been tapped, you know, has been like anointed, tagged by uh, Trump to actually try and work on making the government more efficient? Yes, we've got Elon, the Department of Government Efficiency. Now, look, he can't actually take an official government role. There's going to be limits on what he can do because, of course, he owns so much of SpaceX and Tesla and stuff like that. And I think he would technically have to sell all that. And, you know, conflict of interest is something which may not matter to the executive as much, but it will matter to the Congress people who are looking at this and seeing uh, somebody saying, I think your budget should be cut. Uh, I think we should send less money to your state and they will immediately be able to scream conflict of interest and you know, push back and whatever. So I think the, what we're seeing really is an advisory role rather than an actual member of the government role. That's my take, but I could be completely wrong on this. There's all sorts of shenanigans that happen when politics and money are in play. Uh, like So yeah, there's about $2 trillion of discretionary spending that could be attacked in various ways, but it's I don't see what what's you know happens there. 
I think um, that is too big a thing to talk about, but I don't see cutting money to NASA. I see maybe restructuring some programs to send more money to private space companies. That's absolutely possible. And while we're here, by the way, I should also mention um, you know, Blue Origin and how Jeff Bezos, who owns the Washington Post, wisely stepped back from endorsing a presidential candidate. Um, or some people would not say wisely, they might say <laughs> cowardly, but uh, you know, whatever, it was clearly the right decision in retrospect because actually like endorsements by newspapers tend to not shift the balance particularly much. Uh, yeah, he's going to be angling for a bunch of uh, contracts for Blue Origin because it's really starting to come to, into a position where it can start actually executing on those. Okay, so now the other big part of spaceflight is a uh, Space Force and they get more money than NASA. And while Trump didn't have the idea for Space Force, he was definitely the, you know, the force of nature that made it actually happen. That overruled everyone that said, don't split it out because you'll just get in more infighting. Um, and Space Force happened. And one of the things that Trump had done, though, is he moved the headquarters of Space Command from Colorado to Alabama. And then Biden came in and he said, no, cancel that. We're staying in Colorado. So now with Trump coming in, it's entirely possible that that order gets flipped back and Space Force does end up moving to Alabama. Not sure about that. And of course, on Wednesday, SpaceX announced that they are getting ready for IFT-6, the sixth flight of Starship. Uh, this is going to be just over a month after the fifth flight, a fast turnaround. There's not actually much in the way of changes to the flight profile of this one, which uh, meant that they could actually turn around a lot of things without having to go back and get things reauthorized. They also got like a nice reel of footage from the flight, including some amazing shots of the separation from the booster's point of view. But one of the big differences with this flight is that the launch window is now in the afternoon. And the idea is that it's going to take off during daylight, fly across the Earth at night, and then during the landing, final landing, it will be during daylight. So we'll be able to see it leaving a trail of smoke or whatever as it descends over the Indian Ocean close to the buoy. And I look forward to seeing that if it gets that far. I believe they're also going to do things like test the engines in flight because... Once they do that, once they demonstrate that they can reliably relight the engines in space, they can actually start going on for full orbital tests, uh, which could certainly allow for expanding the envelope further and testing more things. Um, so look, I, I think that space is going to continue to be exciting and wonderful and all that. And I understand that, yes, a lot of you who were, um, a lot of you of certain political leanings may not be feeling so hot about space anymore. And... Hey, you know, I, I think that in the big picture, the, the, the universe is a really, really big picture. And I still think that America is awesome and we want to push those limits and get people to the moon and beyond. Um, another thing, I guess, that could happen is we might finally see starships heading out to Mars. Now, Elon has talked about 2026 and 2028. I think that you know, Elon's really good at stating giving us times that are too short right he almost always misses his times but then when it comes to actually launch he's really good at saying this could probably explode i think there's only a 10 percent chance of it working and then it works so you know it's an interesting kind of optimism from uh, from elon when it comes to timelines versus chance of success i don't think 2026 is going to see six starships i don't think it'll see one starship going to uh to mars I think 2028 maybe but then the mars window is right at the end of the year it's actually past when the election goes so who's paying for this is this spacex doing this maybe um yeah look it's going to be an interesting few years and uh, obviously i don't know i i, I think <sighs> i think uh you know i'm, I'm still going to be here telling the stories the way it is and making penis jokes i'm scott manley fly safe